Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm David Levy, Dean of the Law School. Welcome to the Brainerd Curry Memorial Lecture. This lecture series is named in honor of Professor Brainerd Curry, who taught contracts, admiralty, and conflict, conflicts of laws at Duke from 1946 to 1949, and then again from 1961 to 65. He was an admired scholar and, and a beloved teacher at Duke, as well as at several other law schools around the country. He was the preeminent theorist of his time on the conflict of laws. This lecture series began in 1967, and it has brought scholars of the first rank here to the law school. This year is no exception. How fortunate we are to have Professor Michael Moore as our Curry lecturer. Professor Moore is a distinguished scholar who holds the Charles R. Walgreen Jr. Chair, the first university-wide chair at the University of Illinois. He is co-director of the program in Law and Philosophy and holds appointments in Law, Philosophy, and at the Center for Advanced Studies. Professor Moore will be properly introduced by our own polymath, Professor Matt Adler, the Richard A. Horvitz Professor of Law, Economics, Philosophy, and Public Policy here at Duke. Professor Adler. Thank you, Dean. It is my great honor to introduce our Curry Lecturer, Professor Michael Moore, Charles R. Walgreen, Jr., University Endowed Chair at the University of Illinois. Michael is, without doubt, one of the preeminent legal philosophers of our time. He is the author of seven books, a couple more forthcoming, and almost 100 articles or book chapters. Michael is perhaps best known for his work on the criminal law, on causation, and on metaethics. He is the leading and most sophisticated expositor of a non-utilitarian, specifically retributivist, account of criminal punishment. Michael's 2009 book, Causation and Responsibility, is by common agreement the most important book on law and causation for at least a half century, since Hart and Honoré's Causation and the Law. With respect to metaethics, Michael has vigorously defended the position known as moral realism, that there are right and knowable answers to moral and legal questions which transcend the conventions, beliefs, and practices of any particular society or group of individuals. Moral realism is now a somewhat more respectable position in academic philosophy than it was in the bad old days when the standard view was that making a moral statement was akin to expressing a preference or expressing an emotion. But Michael courageously and brilliantly defended moral realism long before it gained currency. Michael has written more about these topics than about constitutional law, but I should say that his 1985 article on a natural law theory of interpretation is a gem worth its weight in gold. And today we will have the privilege of seeing the Morian intellect trained once more on constitutional issues in this lecture on the elusive quest for a constitutional right to liberty. Let me finally say on a personal note that it was my great good fortune to have Michael Moore and Heidi Hurd, who's in the audience today, as senior colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania Law School when I started my law teaching career there more than 20 years ago. Michael and Heidi were, for me, the paradigms of the legal intellectual. Rigorous, self-critical, argumentative without a hint of ideology or bluster, and just plain smart. They were mentors by including me in the numerous conferences and workshops that they always seemed to be organizing, but just as importantly, by modeling what it meant to be a law professor. And now, without further ado, let's welcome Professor Michael Moore to deliver our 2016 Brainerd Curry Memorial Lecture. Thank you, Matt. Well, that was a lovely introduction by my longtime colleague and good friend. Matt Adler and Dean Levy as well, thank you very much for welcoming me to this lecture. Delighted to give the Curry Lecture. Unbeknownst to those who invited me, Brainerd Curry was actually the co-author, co-editor of the Admiralty Casebook that I used in law school when I took Admiralty in 1966 from Mark G. Wolf Howe. 
I remember wondering at the time who he was. He unfortunately had a, an early death, but I am very pleased to give a lecture in a series named after this distinguished conflicts uh, and admiralty scholar. Also very pleased to have predecessors like Roger Trainer, who was your first Curry lecture in 1967, Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court during the years that I practiced uh, out in San Francisco. A very distinguished string of lectures, and I'll see if I can live up to the introductory billing uh, and to the precedent that has been set in the lecture. The topic as this poster that was sent out, very nice poster, um, is the constitutional right to liberty. I see it as a two-layered topic. It's really about the right to liberty in moral and political theory as it can then be translated into a constitutional right to liberty. The title of the talk, The Elusive Quest, is designed to capture the difficulty in both political theory and in constitutional law in dealing with the right to liberty. In political theory from the far right, the Burkean social conservatives, to the liberal left, Ronald Dworkin and the egalitarian um, liberals, there is a skepticism that there is such a right to liberty in political theory. In constitutional law, as we've seen most recently last June, there's a great deal of skepticism about an unenumerated set of liberties being something the court can apply as part of the Constitution to overturn democratic legislation. So it's contested and it is elusive, and the name of the game is to see if one can help courts as they try to decide what should and should not be part of the constitutional right to liberty. Um, the organization of the talk is in two parts, one in political theory, one in constitutional law. I'm going to preface it with a rather long discussion, however, of Chief Justice Roberts' dissenting opinion in Obergefell v. Hodges, the decision last June on same-sex marriages, because Roberts has thrown down the gauntlet, taken up, I noticed, by most of my colleagues, their symposia now all over the country, on the relevance of political philosophy to constitutional law. Because in his dissent, he says, it's just irrelevant what political philosophy does to what we as lawyers have to do in deciding constitutional rights. So to justify my mode of organization, I thought I would take issue with the Chief Justice uh, in his dissent. We couldn't have a more topical topic. Not only is Obergefell of recent vintage and still much a matter of contemporary dispute, but of course, my former colleague on the Stanford faculty, Nino Scalia, is passing 12 days ago. And the issue of his replacement and what sort of judge will replace him will, in fact, occupy us enormously for the next, depending on what the Republicans do, two months, 12 months, whatever it's going to be. So that we're going to have this issue combined, actually, because for Scalia, Obergefell, as he says in his dissent, was the high water mark, which for him was not a term of praise, the high water mark, the furthest extension he said he could imagine of the court's claimed power to declare liberties not enumerated in the Constitution, nonetheless a right of every citizen. So the topic is going to be in front of us. I noticed Ted Cruz already has the jump on us. His questions for the Senate Judiciary Committee from 2014 onward were specifically on substantive due process, fundamental liberties, and even more specifically on the right to marriage with regard to same-sex marriages uh, as issues to ask each judicial nominee before the Senate Judiciary Committee. So this issue is going to be with us at the forefront of political discussion for the next uh, at least year, depending on how much delay is on the replacement. Uh, I have a long paper that I'm not going to read to you. Um, I'm just going to talk at you and briefly at that. So. In about 50 minutes, we will see if we can summarize uh, what I hope is more fully defended in the longer paper, which I would uh, eventually like to publish. Uh, let me begin with the gauntlet thrown down to political philosophers by the Chief Justice. Roberts, political philosophy deals with things as they ought to be. It's normative. It tells us what we ought to have by way of law. Judges are bound by the law that we have. Their obligation is to apply the law and only the law, but the laws it is, not the laws it ought to be, the familiar distinction between is and ought of a certain kind of jurisprudence. I think that sounds better than it is, 
Because if you think about the law as it is, can the law as it is actually incorporate things that until incorporated are plainly not legal? So with a young professor at uh, George Mason last week I was chatting with, he said, well, try this example. Suppose Marco Rubio was slightly younger than he is, so the issue came up as to whether he really is 35 and thus eligible under the Constitution to serve as president should be, he be elected. You look at his birth certificate, you look at the present date, how do you figure out whether he's 35 if you're a judge? Well, you have to do some subtraction, birth date from present date to see at the time of the election whether he'll be 35 or not. Well, but that's arithmetic, not law. But you think, no, I think when it says 35, the Constitution intends you to do some non-legal things like use arithmetic. Now, suppose a legal standard doesn't use arithmetic. Suppose it uses what John Locke in his lectures in 1660 said is a lot like arithmetic, the famous quotation of Locke. You can know the truths of the natural rights of man with the certainty that you can know the truths of mathematics. True son of the Enlightenment, John. But nonetheless, suppose now it's moral knowledge. Suppose you're a judge and the standard in front of you says, you're to give the child in a disputed custody case of divorce to that parent that will maximize the best interest of the child. Or you're in a deportation proceeding under a federal statute that says a resident alien can be deported if convicted of a crime of moral turpitude or you're in a citizenship proceeding which under federal statute is to be decided if you have good moral character. Don't those statutes direct you as a judge to figure out what good moral character is, what the good life is that you can maximize by custody adjudication, and whether or not someone has done some breach of morality. Indeed, how would you figure that out? Unless you did the moral reasoning that the law requires you to do to do the legal reasoning. So that separation prima facie is suspect when you're interpreting clauses that say your job as a judge is to give every citizen the process that is due them, the protection of the laws that is equal, punishments that are not cruel, searches that are not unreasonable, and the like. In each instance, it looks like you're being directed to figure out for yourself what equality is, in the case of liberty, what liberty is, not because it's something else, but because the law directs you to make that calculation as hard as it might be. So when, when I hear the Chief Justice, joined incidentally by Scalia and Thomas in his dissent, in Obergefell, complain about academics in general, his famous Fourth Circuit comment of a few years ago was, you know, you pick up a law review, what are you likely to find? Probably Immanuel Kant on the relevance of 18th century evidence law to the categorical imperative. There's a certain suspicion of academics that they're not doing anything relevant to the law. That's a suspicion that I think one needs to combat. I prefer the story of Harry Blackman, who used to go out to the Aspen Institute in the summers. So with Norval Morris at the University of Chicago, he could sit around and discuss the Hart-Devlin debate, not because in his opinions he would adopt Hart or Devlin or Mill or anybody else, but so that he would have a better insight into what liberty was that under substantive due process he saw it as his job to protect. Very different attitude. Now what is it that we're supposed to do as judges if it's not use moral judgment? Well, there's the usual standbys of looking to the text, its plain meaning, precedential decision. I think those are undisputed ingredients in any judicial toolkit for interpreting the Constitution. But the ones that the social conservative minority presently on the court emphasizes are two in addition. One is the original understanding. Scalia's dissent joined by Thomas's dissent says this is determinative in a case like Obergefell of same-sex marriage. What's determinative? Because when the language of due process of law was used in 1791 in the Fifth Amendment and in 1868 in the 14th Amendment, Everyone understood marriage to be a union of a single man with a single woman. In which event, Scalia, in his opinion, says that's determinative. The exemplars the framers had in mind and that their original audience understood determines the meaning of those phrases for subsequent generations. Now, the usual debate with originalists like Scalia is by people who 
like Earl Warren, talk about the standards of decency that mark the progress of a maturing society, 1958, Cope v. Dulles, the people who talk about living constitutions. That isn't the debate that I had with my old colleague Scalia, starting in 1988 when he and I ran a, I called it the wake for Bork's lost Supreme Court seat at the University of Virginia. Uh, as I was telling your dean a moment ago, Scalia and I congratulated ourselves because Richard Epstein missed his flight, so the two of us actually got to talk. And if you know Richard, you would know that wasn't going to otherwise happen. But here was the argument, which you can see Scalia didn't buy. Maybe I'll do better with you. If you're an originalist, you're supposed to take the facts of history as they occur. You're supposed to take the history, not make it up. Here's the history. The framers that you care about, Madison and Hamilton in 1791, Bingham and others in 1868, were believers, unlike Bork, in natural rights. They thought they existed just like Locke said they did, as real entities with real natures. And like every other user of the English language, when they use language to refer to those rights, they intended the audience judges that would be applying the language to figure out the nature of the thing to which reference was being made and apply that as the meaning of the phrase. They didn't intend because nobody intends. The pictured exemplars of the kind to be what philosophers call the extension determiners, the things that give the meaning of the phrase. Loads of examples of that in science, everyday life, moral theory, and in law. Just one example. Presidential study on the commission of death handed by a friend of mine, Alex Capron, in the 80s. Said, you know, the problem with judges is they might think that if we give examples of death or definitions of death, that that fixes the meaning of death for legal purposes. We want judges to understand when we put death in the various statutes in which it's used, like organ donation, homicide statutes, and the like, it's open to further and further insights of the scientific and medical community and moral insights about personhood about when someone's really dead. And the fact that their heart and lungs have ceased functioning doesn't mean they're really dead by virtue of the fact that in cold water there's enough preservation that within 45 minutes they actually can be revived. So what would be called conventionally dead isn't really dead so long as you interpret death by the nature of the thing referred to and not by the pictured exemplars or even definitions and concepts the authoritative users had in mind. So that was my argument about originalism. On that ground, I'm the real originalist. The semantic intentions with which the framers spoke was not to use their exemplars to fix what's a cruel and unusual punishment. Sure, they didn't think death was cruel and unusual. They, however, thought there was such a thing as undeserved, disproportionate punishment, and that kind is what they intended to refer to with cruel and unusual. They didn't name the rack and the screw either, but surely they intended um, someone to figure out what cruel and unusual was in terms of disproportionate, undeserved punishment. So that's the originalist arsenal. The Chief Justice in Obergefell has a different alternative to doing the Blackman-like moral reasoning himself. And that's where Chief Justice Roberts says, well, we need to look to tradition. We need to look not to the framers' beliefs at a particular time, but to the ongoing tradition in our society. And the tradition, he rightly, I think, claims as a matter of social fact, is that marriages, even in societies that did not in any way denigrate same-sex relationships, nonetheless did not have marriage between those sexes. And so that settles the issue for me. Now, why tradition? Well, it is possible to think, as the Chief Justice says, you need to rein in, he says, the strong medicine of substantive due process. Well, any determinant standard would do that. Height and hair color of litigants will do that. So surely you need to say something more than I need a determinant standard. Surely there has to be something authoritative about tradition that makes it a good justifying reason for limiting liberty as granted by the Constitution. What would that authority be? In the larger paper, I run through a series of possibilities. If you're a relativist or a preference utilitarian, that means natural rights nature is given by what traditions have held them to be. But nobody, at least nobody, can get through the Senate Judiciary Committee's confirmation hearings. Nobody is a kind of avowed skeptic Bork showed us uh, as much. 
So it's not skepticism. There is what Joel Feinberg, political philosopher at Arizona, calls the conservative principle, third possibility. First possibility, relativism. Second possibility, preference utilitarianism. Third possibility, you could be someone who thinks that a majority is entitled to live by its own ideals, even if they're not right. For those of you who remember American history, remember the frigate captain in 1812 war. My country, right or wrong, but still my country. My tradition, right or wrong, but still my tradition would be the claim of the conservative principle. Think for a moment what that means. So I really value my marriage to someone of the opposite sex and of the same race. Does that give me, or, and most Americans do the same. We share those preferences and those beliefs. We have a tradition. Does that give me a reason to demand that you also conform just for what reason? Because I want society to look like me. I can't imagine a principle nor, more inimical to liberty than the idea that although the tradition makes no moral claims to being morally correct or, or required, it nonetheless has a claim just by virtue of conformity. I can imagine a non-liberal society that likes that. Hard to imagine a society where the rights of the minority were one half of what we were supposed to get under this constitutional scheme against impositions of the majority if they were not for a better reason than that one. Uh, I don't think any of these are what Chief Justice Roberts believes. I think he's a Burkean conservative. I think what he thinks is what Burke said with respect to Locke and Rousseau, specifically on the right to liberty in the late 18th century. Traditions have wisdom in them that no individual intelligence should have the effrontery to challenge. How could it be, he said, that an individual could go against the collective wisdom of the ages, specifically to Locke and Rousseau, on the right to liberty? What makes you think your intelligence can in fact go against the wisdom that has come down through centuries of other people just as smart as you thinking about it. There I think Roberts is quite sincere in his opinion when he says, who do we think we are in his dissent? Showing a modesty of judgment as well as a modesty of power with regard to the Supreme Court's ability to go against tradition for millennia on what kinds of people can get married. I actually have said I think there's quite something, I wrote a paper on Burke years ago, quite something to the Burkean notion. Whatever you can be right about, as Matt Adler said, I'm one of those who think like Locke, you can be right about moral questions, you can be wrong about. And if you can be wrong about it and other people sincerely disagree with you whom you respect, that's a reason to wonder whether you've got it right. Perfectly true. On the other hand, it cannot be for a rational creature a complete suspension of judgment. That one time, a generation ago, famous tract of judicial conservatism, John Hart Ely's Democracy and Distrust, which is as skeptical as anybody about a judge's ability to apply unenumerated rights, used to say, if you look at what traditions in America are, you tend to think of nice things, Palco v. Connecticut, sort of nice stuff. But remember the traditions where people like I and Ely grew up our tradition was all people of another race had to be out of town at sunset. The whistle went off and you had to leave. You rode people out of rail. There are evil traditions, and the evil of them is not to be judged by tradition. It's by the judge's own judgment of how right or how wrong does tradition get it. So whatever weight you give to tradition, it can't be the last question, even if it were the first, for someone like Chief Justice Roberts. He says in his dissent he does not think the Constitution adopts John Stuart Mill any more, as Holmes said, than it adopts Spencer and others of his day in political philosophy. Surely right. But that's only to say judges have a much tougher job. They don't get to spout Mill or Aquinas or Rawls or Nozick or anybody else. They have to figure out for themselves what rights people have when something is unequal, when something is um, unjust because dep depriving of liberty, tougher job. Remember our Madisonian compromise. There are two good things intrinsically. There's democracy, the right of the majority to rule, and there are the rights of individuals that the democratic majority cannot overturn, and the jobs judge in our constitutional democracy is to do both of those. You don't get to do um, just one. Well, as my father used to say, that's sounding a bit like a sermon, so let me move on. Um, with respect, then, to the two main topics, the main show, 
Um, it's one thing to extol judges to figure out things like liberty, equality, property, the three rights of our revolution. It's another to say, well, how would you do the job yourself? So the remaining part of my remarks is, what do I think it is? Not so judges can write it down, but as a prod to thought, the way Blackman used the Aspen Institute, as a prod to thought in doing the thinking they have to do to exercise their constitutional res responsibilities. Take political philosophy first. Here's three rather immodest questions. Do we have any natural rights? Is the right to liberty one of them? And if so, what's its content? Now, the first one is something we're not going to settle today. As Matt said, I've defended that at whatever length I could in past writings. I do think we have natural rights. It's a form of objectivism. It is true that natural as a word is a very unfortunate choice. It sort of scares people. It makes them think that they think of Justice Holmes when he said in Southern Pacific v. Jensen, what's the natural law? It's this brooding omnipresence in the sky, right? It's, it's sort of like aurora borealis, but without the lights. A natural phenomenon that is nonetheless ghostly and spooky. Get rid of the word natural. I was at the last seminar that H.L.A. Hart had at Oxford when a young legal philosopher that Heidi knows well um, was giving a paper on natural law, natural rights. Finally, Herbert couldn't stand it anymore. He says, what do you mean by natural? And this young guy, so taken aback by the senior philosopher of the legal, English-speaking legal tradition, asking him the obvious question, took off into this, well, if you're in the leafy green forest, I think he even had some wood nymphs in there. Hart couldn't stand it, he said. So, so basically, just doing what comes naturally, right? So you need to get all those connotations out of it. All you mean are the sorts of things we were debating in our last presidency with the second Bush. The human rights, the moral rights people have, as Douglas says in Griswold, that are not created by the Constitution even when they're named by the Constitution. Rights, as he said, older than our Bill of Rights, which Biden picked up in his confirmation hearings um, for Thomas. Namely, the kinds of rights you get as a human being that are antecedent to the law that the law can name but doesn't create, like the right not to be tortured. Uh, uh, at issue in the last administration, or perhaps not the right to be assassinated at issue in the present administration with its targeted killings. Uh, that's what you should mean by natural rights. Do people dispute them? Of course they do. Jeremy Bentham, no slouch when it came to ethics, called them nonsense on stilts. Full quote, rights are nonsense, natural rights are nonsense on stilts. But it's easier for us in our tradition because in our tradition, as I said, the Madisonian Compromise says there's two things that are intrinsically good, democracy and the limits on democracy of natural rights. If you don't believe in the second thing, it's got to be really hard to make sense of this enterprise called judicial review, which is mostly what Ely's book was about. Not being a believer in natural rights, he said the only thing you should promote is democracy because the other stuff doesn't exist. If you think it exists, you've got two things to protect. Hard to make sense of it if you don't think that. So let's just assume there are natural rights. Is the right to liberty one of them? My second question. Well, creep up on the Burkean skepticism that there is no right to liberty in the following set of questions, four of them. One is, what do you mean by liberty? Some people have written an enormous amount about it. It's, um, it's a word that's much overused. I used the example of Mel Gibson in Braveheart, a film that I did not admire. He has William Wallace in 1307 dying, shouting the word freedom. God only knows what 1307 freedom meant to William Wallace. I think it meant get the damn British off my back. But the famous book by Isaiah Berlin, Four Essays on Liberty, says there's over 200 senses of the word. So you need to do some stipulation. Let me shortcut it. I think Clarence Thomas in his dissent in Obergefell is absolutely right. The liberty enshrined in the Constitution is what Berlin would have called negative liberty, his famous distinction, Berlin's, between positive liberty, which is the opportunity to get something, and negative liberty, which is the absence of one of the things, but only one of the things, that prevents you from having that opportunity, which is legal restraint, coercive sanctions. So negative liberty, absence of restraint. Now, Thomas makes that a very interesting question, Obergefell, by the vagueness of what a restraint is. The clear case is a criminal prohibition with coercive sanctions. That's a restraint, the absence of which is negative liberty. Thomas, yeah, but in the cases of marriage, they're not prohibiting marriage. They're just not offering you marriage if you're of the same sex. 
He doesn't do this, but say the same thing for Loving v. Virginia, the miscegenation case in the 1960s that the Supreme Court decided. Virginia, suppose it didn't criminalize marriages across races. It simply said as a condition of getting married, of having a valid marriage in Virginia, the only ones who can have it are members of the same race. According to the Thomas analysis, that would only be taking positive liberty, not negative liberty. I think the line in my paper on that is, if there were a God, she wouldn't reason like a tax lawyer. That's too fine a line to be sustained as a matter of morality. Why that's so, I think, is an extremely interesting question. You might think like Aquinas, every state has to offer contract to its citizens. You might remember that's one of Aquinas' two examples, where he says, the divine law as known through human nature, the natural law, gives you the right to contract, like the right to property. We'll leave it to human law to work out the details. I'm too damn busy up here, God says, to give you the details of the bailment contracts in 12th century France. But um, nonetheless, you have the basic right. Well, that would be one view. Virginia and the states that come up in the Obergefell case have an obligation to provide a particular kind of contract to its citizens. And more than that, they've monopolized the granting of such contracts. Now, if the state didn't have the obligation, then the argument really should be framed in terms of equality rather than liberty. But if there's such an obligation not given, that's as effective as a criminal prohibition, in which event I think the five-member majority is right to go off on liberty more than equality in its majority opinion. But a close and interesting question. And as I say, you start out where I think Thomas is right about the kind of liberty, maybe not so good on exactly what negative liberty uh, actually is. Anyway, first question, what is liberty? Only negative liberty is what the Constitution protects. Second question, then, is why is that a good thing? Why is that so good that we would have, morally, a right to be free of legal restraint? And here there's a battery of reasons that the history of political philosophy has produced. It's what people universally prefer, something that some of your philosophy department members were discussing last night about how good that is to give people what their preferences are. Um, it's because there are certain costs of enforcement that get very expensive for certain kinds of crimes, ones that are highly motivated, done in private, with few non-consenting participants or witnesses, which means the enforcement cost includes things like putting the park rangers at Yosemite in 1965 with one-way glass to see if anybody's doing any homosexual activity in the stalls below. That's costly not just in terms of park ranger salaries, but in terms of privacy and other values. So, so there's enforcement costs of, of a variety of kinds. There's the crime tariff, where if in fact artificially restrict the supply of goods to those willing to break the law, all of a sudden you finance organized crime. If you prohibit that stuff, as the government of Columbia, I was at Buffalo in 1992 when they presented their reparation demands to the United States government, you've ruined our government infrastructure by making criminal the use of recreational drugs such that the enormous profits is what has made our government actually not work. That's a cost. Anyway, there are all those costs. The two that I think really stand behind negative liberty are none of these. I think the two that really stand behind it are what people call autonomy. There's two versions of autonomy in moral philosophy. There's Kant's, sorry, Chief Justice Roberts. It's not Bulgarian evidence law. It's Kant on autonomy. Um, there's Kant's and there's Mill's. Kantian autonomy. There's value in the reasons for which people act and not just the actions that they do. So to act for right reason in his definition is autonomous action. The example he gives is gift giving. If you prohibit people from not making, so that is you require them to make gifts, you've turned gifts into taxes. Namely, the motive for the giving now is to avoid coercive sanctions rather than the benevolence that itself had value. And a reason to stay the state's hand is to allow people to do the giving, but really giving rather than simply being coerced to give, i.e. paying a tax. Independent value that justifies staying the state's hand on getting people to do what they ought to do. Mill is different. It's not the reason for which you act, it's the processes of choice through which you make the choice to act. Those need to be free, as Mill said, otherwise you're nothing more than a steam engine, is what he said, his 19th century machine. Today it would probably be one of Walter's neuroscience machines or something, but nonetheless. You're just a machine unless, what? Unless you're the author of your own life so that you make the kind of choices that define the person that you are. 
you have to be free of coercion, otherwise you don't have the value that only the author of their own lives can have. What does free mean there? It doesn't mean acting for right reasons, it rather means free of coercion in the processes of those choices that form the kind of person that you will become. Millian autonomy. Now, third question. That's the litany of values. How good is it? And the answer is, surely, Burke is right. Not good enough to justify a right to liberty. As Burke said, if those values justified liberty in general, we would have not liberty but anarchy. Because that would say you're free constantly of the coercive sanctions of the criminal law, and nobody can mean that. Dworkin in our own day makes the same point. So fourth question, what sort of answers then do people give to this sort of obvious objection to liberty so defined and so valued? Well, one answer is you could remove how stringently a right protects something. You could reduce the force of rights. In a well-known article called There Is No Such Thing as a Right to Liberty, Dworkin goes after that one correctly, I think, saying, if you reduce the force of rights as much as you would have to, it would no longer be a right. In which event, it would not be the kind of thing correctly conceptualized as a right. It's better conceptualized as a presumption in favor of liberty, but not an enforceable right, even in morality, before you get to the law. So that doesn't look very promising. The second route, the route partly explored by egalitarian liberals like Rawls and Dworkin, is the route that says, well, we deal with discrete liberties rather than a general right to liberty so that that avoids the reductio to anarchy because only certain kinds of choices. That's OK as far as it goes, but it doesn't go far enough because what it doesn't say is the unity that lies behind the freedom of state coercion. That Brandeis said in Olmsted, the right most prized by all, the right to be let alone, it doesn't capture what people sense is so important about liberty, even if it's more important in the kind of liberties that Rawls and Dworkin have in mind. So, Liberalism, as I define it, in its standard view, follows not the egalitarians, but the libertarians that followed Mill from his 1859 essay on liberty. I'm not a defender of the harm principle, but it's, use, it's useful for illustration. Mill, all freedom is a good. There are good reasons to curtail it, of course. All we need to figure out is what those reasons are. The good reasons, Mill, the reason that you can use legitimately state coercion is to prevent harm to other people. Punishment's a harm. It can only be justified by preventing a greater harm, and therefore the behavior regulated has to be harmful to other people. Behavior that only harms the actor himself, only offends people, or is morally disapproved by the majority but is not harmful, those are insufficient grounds for coercive legislation, merely in liberalism. Um, notice that Mills actually got two rights tucked in there, and that's the structure, I think, of political philosophy. There are really two rights to liberty. One is what I call the derived right. It's derived because it's derived from the basic thing, which is a duty of every legislator in a democratic society to aim at certain things rather than others in their coercive legislation. There's a dispute about that. The Millian critic, Sir James Fitzjames Stephen, foremost exponent of the criminal law of England in the 19th century, had said, in a democracy, the only thing that limits a legislator is what most of his, represent most of his constituents believe, and he should simply represent their views. Mill. From Mill to Teddy Roosevelt, not a chance. Democracy works best when you have principles that guide your legislation. And if, on regular free elections, the electorate doesn't like it, they throw you out of office despite having had the advantage of the bully pulpit to have convinced them otherwise. That looks like a better notion of democracy, Mill said, in which event? First right to liberty, the right derivative of the legislative obligation to only use some reasons and not others to justify coercion. The second right is the right that Blackman, O'Connor, and others have sought the right to define a sphere, or in O'Connor's words, a realm of liberty, a kind of action that is relatively immune to state regulation except for the most compelling kinds of reasons. That protects actions against state coercion for any reason, whereas the first right only protects you against certain kinds of reasons, although potentially protects any action. So Mill has the harm principle to do both sets of work. Now, the standard thing people say, the Canadian Supreme Court, for example, 
considered the harm principle in detail just nine years ago. Unlike our court, it took seriously that this might be a constitutional principle and rejected it except for a concurring opinion or two. Um, it should be rejected. The harm principle misses something essential. It's not the problem that Stevens to, if you took virtually any criminal law class in America, like up at the University of Chicago, Bruce Harcourt's class, um, it's not the problem that all actions harm others. Even if that were true, it's irrelevant to this point. The derived right to liberty looks to the reasons for legislation. So even if riding a motorcycle without a helmet doesn't just hurt the rider, but hurts others with health costs or with blood on the highway. If you're asking the motivational question, yeah, but were those harms the ones that motivated the passage of the legislation? That's not a question that is in any way affected by there being multiple consequences of a reaction. So that objection passes by the by. The real objection to the harm principle is the utilitarianism behind it. Criminal law, as Matthew says, I have said for a long time, has to have something to do with moral blameworthiness. It's harsh treatment imposed with moral censure, and it's only fairly imposed on someone who deserves it, i.e., by their culpable wrongdoing, they have, in fact, deserved the kind of harsh treatment we think of as criminal punishment. That means the principle of criminal legislation ought not to be for behavior that harms, but rather for behavior that itself is morally wrong. It's only morally wrongful behavior that culpably is done that deserves the sanctions of the criminal law, and the right to liberty should be a right not to be coerced out of non-wrongful behavior prima facie. That actually would be what someone should aim at in what's now become a kind of chorus of what's called non-standard or sometimes perfectionist, or what I call legal moralist liberalism. It's not of the standard Millian kind, unlike Mill, who said, you know, you really shouldn't prohibit it just because you think it's morally wrong. Moral wrongness becomes the center notion of the wrongdoing principle. It's true most things that are wrong are harms that are caused. Most harms that are caused are morally wrong, but there are harmless wrongs, wrongless harms. They aren't the same principles. And they give you quite different results when you ask about the proper reasons that should motivate coercive legislation. So when you see opinions by justices who, unbeknownst to them, are applying an old debate in political philosophy, so that you see Blackman or Stevens in Bauer's dissents saying it's an improper reason for the state to try to use the moral wrongness of the behavior as a reason for its prohibition. Or you see Scalia on the other side saying, are you crazy? What do you think the criminal law does? It mostly uses the wrongness of behavior to justify prohibiting things like murder, rape, arson, and mayhem. Um, that debate recapitulates the debate between people who say Mill's wrong. That's not what liberalism is about. Liberalism is about prohibiting morally wrongful behavior. And then the debate between social conservatives and liberals is not with liberals pretending that the social conservatives are making the wrong kind of argument. It's rather they're applying the wrong kind of morality. It's a substantive first order disagreement, I think, that's really going on in cases like Bowers and other applications of political philosophy. It's not that you think it's a wrong reason. If you really thought sexual relations between members of the same sex was morally wrong, that would be, by my lights, a valid kind of reason to prohibit it. It really is the argument, is it wrong or not, that I think guides what's usually called legal moralist um, liberalism. So that's the derived right to liberty in political philosophy. The basic right to liberty deals not with reasons, but rather with actions. And it's the question of a balance between what reasons does the state have, well, which reasons are permissible to coerce behavior, preventing or punishing wrongful behavior. What's the harm of so preventing the values that stand behind the presumption of liberty? Everyone sees that for the balance that it is a hard balance to make, but fortunately it seems to have two safe harbors. The first safe harbor is where the behavior regulated is just not morally wrong. I always wondered how that argument went in the New York Court of Appeals when it had to judge the constitutionality under the New York Constitution of the prohibition of the New York penal law that prohibited oral sex between heterosexual married couples. It was argued, I believe, under the harm principle, but imagine it under the wrong principle. Is there something wrong? with this form of sex? Is there something wrong with non-procreative sex? 
such that Connecticut could, in fact, prohibit it as it came up in Griswold v. Connecticut. I take it a safe harbor of liberty is a harbor that says the state lacks any legitimate reason whatsoever for prohibition. That makes the balance easy. Then the values that stand behind the presumption of liberty clearly outweigh what is nothing. There is no value of a legitimate kind because nothing is being prevented or punished that was morally wrong to start with on this view of liberalism. The other safe harbor is the harbor that depends not on the absence of a good reason, but on the presence of a reason not to prohibit that's a strong reason. And there I think the central value is million autonomy as I described it. Are some choices so central to the definition and formation of a personality that except for the most compelling reason the state should stand behind them? Take O'Connor's view of abortion. A two-level judgment. It might indeed be morally wrong prima facie that gives the state a reason to prohibit it. But it is more wrong for the state to compel the woman to in fact make one choice rather than another in which event the state should, state should stay its hand, not because it doesn't have a good reason, but because there's such a compelling reason on the other side in terms of the formative decisions about whether to have a child or not, or how your body is to be used, depending on what you think the right involved is in Roe v. Wade. Um, that is the kind of right, the kind of interest that outweighs the reason of the state. Two safe harbors, huge middle ground in between in political philosophy, namely, there's some reason for some minor social wrongs. But by and large, the reason's not good enough. We don't criminalize promise-breaking, negligent torts, all the things that Judith Schlar in her book called the ordinary vices that we engage in in daily life. We don't even though we recognize there's some wrongness being um, engaged in. Why is that? Because the liberty to engage in it is worth more. More important, you make the free choice than the right choice on those kinds of issues. Quickly then on constitutional law. Suppose there are these two rights that we all have, a right not to be coerced for the wrong reasons and a right not to be coerced for any reason, um, unless it's A, a good reason, the kind that's permissible, and B, good enough to outweigh the need to have autonomous choices for certain kinds of choices, two sorts of rights. Constitutional law could easily mirror them. The simple view would be for every natural right, there's a constitutional right. That's too simple. There was perhaps in our history one society that actually thought that they could get by without the law having to recognize a moral right before it became a right enforceable in the courts. Massachusetts Bay Colony thought for 10 years they could make do without a penal code because God's law would be sufficient. They, of course, had the common law of England behind them even if they didn't apply it. But nonetheless, most societies think you have to have some institutional recognition of a moral right before it becomes a legal right and certainly before it becomes a constitutional right. Well, that's the much debated issue of what's the textual home for the right to liberty under our Constitution. When Scalia and I were running this panel in 88, there was a young man who stood up and gave a paper called The Higher Law Background of the Privileges or Immunities Clause, Clarence Thomas, uh, then head of the EEOC. Thomas, liberty's in the wrong place. Doesn't belong in subsidy due process. It really belongs in the National P&I Clause. Well, Kurt Lash, our current colleague, Heidi's of mine at Illinois, has a book saying the same thing. Maybe so, but unless and until the court overrules the slaughterhouse cases, substantive due process looks like good enough for government work with regard to a textual home. The alternative is to say, look, you don't always have to have direct reference. The Constitution could do what Douglas, with his clumsy, just absolutely almost negligent lack of care for judicial precision, said in Griswold, when he talked about the emanations from the penumbras of no less than five amendments, none of which included the due process clauses. The point wasn't as bad as the mode of its expression. James Wilson, legal architect of the American Revolution, in his article on natural rights says, of all the rights we fought our revolution for, liberty is the foundational one. Indeed, it is at the base of all the other rights. It is the right foremost amongst all rights that are more enumerated in our documents. Um, if that's what you think, then the right to liberty has textual reference, not of a direct sort, but of a presupposed indirect sort. Anyway, you need institutional support of that kind to make it into a constitutional right. You also, I think, need a standard that makes it justici justiciable. It has to be administrable. There's nothing in morality about administering rights. And thirdly, you need to, in fact, have respect for the co-branches of government that, in fact, have judgments on these issues, legislature, and executive, you need some restraint of comedy for other branches. With those three things, you can then take the political philosophy, filter it through, and perhaps get a constitutional right.
In the case of liberty, look what happens when you do that. The derived right to liberty when you're addressing individual legislators is non-problematic psychologically because you're telling them what to aim at in their legislation. But put that doctrine in the hands of a court, and now a court has to decide what not a legislator believed, but what the legislature was trying to do. What was its motives? Not unknown in constitutional law, starting with McCulloch versus Maryland and the pretext analysis that Chief Justice Marshall invited, but always something of a problematic notion. Rehnquist, Scalia, before them, Black said, this stuff makes no sense. How do you attribute intentions to a corporate body? Right? Legislatures can't feel pain. They don't, feel, they don't fall in love. They don't have any of the mental attributes of a person. So how do you attribute an intention? It won't help to use the construct we use for construing a statute, because here we're reviewing a statute, and you're going to hold it unconstitutional for the bad motives with which it was passed. You better really mean bad motives and not some construct of construction in interpreting the statute. Uh, my own preferred model is what I kind of call the delegation model. There are people who have relevant motives, those who chair the relevant committees, who draft the bills and the like. And those, by informal consensus, speak for the legislature. But you have to do something like that to make sense uh, of this constitutional right. If you have such a right, what would its content be? Here, I think political philosophy is not only of help, it's about the only help you could possibly get. What are the reasons that are improper depends on what form of liberalism or of conservatism you subscribe to. No help for it. If you're of the million kind, then the reasons will be illegitimate if, for example, they're paternalistic. Political philosophy of the last 50 years is rich and rather clear on what is and what is not paternalistic. Sandra Day O'Connor picked up one easy, low-hanging piece of fruit on that philosophy when she said in Casey, um, well, you know, Mill said if a guy's going over a bridge and doesn't know it's going to fall, you can restrain him long enough to give him the information. You can give what's now called soft paternalism. You can give people information without unduly interfering with their liberty because it allows them to make a better choice than the one they were about to make. So there are some things that look paternalistic, not carefully detailed in, as I say, 50 years of political philosophy. Lots of help. With respect to other bad motives, is it enough that the legislature believes that it's wrong, even if it doesn't think it, it, is it enough that the legislature believes its citizens think the behavior is wrong if the legislature doesn't agree? Did the Connecticut legislature, for example, in Griswold, think that although its constituents, Catholics, believed non-procreative sex was sinful, it didn't share the belief but thought it was reasonable to go ahead and pass a statute because that's what its citizens believed? Mill, that's no reason for coercion. That's simply to reflect your constituents rather than having your own principled sense of what the criminal law should aim at, so that that sort of reason shouldn't be legitimate. If it were immoral, that would be a legitimate reason, but that they believe it to be immoral, and in your own view, erroneously believe it to be immoral, is just a toady to a consensus that has no moral backing to it by your own judgment. So you end up with this derived right to liberty. I think having a content that has a relation to, although not one-to-one, -one, with the um, right in political philosophy. With respect to the basic right to liberty, the Supreme Court's done, I thought, pretty well with one of the poles, one of the safe harbors, namely the one that protects what the court calls fundamental liberties. With the exception of Washington v. Glucksburg, how you get to end your life, it seems to me the court's done a pretty admirable job, not just under substantive due process, but under federal privileges and immunities, moving or residing where you will, even under the Second Amendment, defending yourself through the maintenance of arms. All of those liberties are aspects of the kinds of decisions you might reasonably think a person has to have to be an author of their own lives. In which event, that poll, I think the court's done a pretty good job on. The other poll, they haven't for reasons that Justice Harlan articulated in his concurrence in Griswold. He said, what if I were to think the Connecticut legislature actually thinks non-procreative sex is sinful, how should I judge? He says, well, I don't think that. Do I get to put my judgment against their judgment? He says, well, I don't have to say. I'll just say I'd have to think long and hard about it. I think judges are n n notoriously reluctant to make moral judgments that go against those of the legislature, even when, to articulate the contours of liberty, demands precisely that they make that kind of judgment. 
So let me close with that because uh, I think the thing that has led, as far as I've seen, judicial audiences like Scalia to resist the kind of argument I'm making is just this kind of, it's not skepticism, it's modesty about moral judgments. So this is Chief Justice Berger. In just a statutory interpretation case, he quotes Robert Bolt's version of Sir Thomas More saying the following, this is More supposedly speaking, 1-0 incidentally. The law, Roper, the law, I know what's legal, not what's right, and I'll stick to what's legal, I'm not God. The currents and eddies of right and wrong, which you find such plain sailing, I can't navigate, I'm no voyager. But in the thickets of law, oh, there I'm a forester. If you've got this sense that you have technical legal knowledge that is adequate to your job and you really don't know the morality, that would be a pretty good reason not to do the moral judgments. What if your job is that the thickets of the law require you to figure out when someone is at liberty or is deserving of equal treatment or should be free of disproportionate punishment? You don't have that luxury of saying, I can just do the technical plain meaning of explicit text, Chief Justice Berger in his confirmation hearings. I'm just an umpire that plays baseball by the rules and I call them like I see them. You can play baseball that way, it's really hard to play constitutional law that way when you have the clauses naming his rights generally specified uh, as these. I think judges who try that end up, in Socrates' language, talking about his own judges. If indeed they end up thinking the law they are applying is divorced of justice, then as he says, when you get that keen legal mind into the upper air of political philosophy, out of his pleas and rejoinders, into the contemplation of justice and injustice in their own nature, um, and their differences from one another and their, from all other things, he's dizzied by the height at which he is hanging. He being dismayed and lost and stammering broken words, no fan Socrates laughed at not by uneducated persons, but by every man who has not been brought up a slave. Uh, you can't do the law without being able to do the moral philosophy, and the name of the game is not to scorn it, but to actually study it so that you can do your job better. That's my sermon, thanks. Thank you. In view of the hour, we are adjourned. Thank you. That was wonderful.